of this session. Uh, you can uh, ask questions. There is a, a menu for, for asking questions. Then we'll collect all the questions during the, uh, the, the different talks. And then we'll, uh, we'll have like 50, uh, 15 minutes for, uh, uh, for a Q&A. So going to the point, the, the first uh, speaker of today is uh, Professor uh, Daniela Tower. Is a professor from uh, Delta University, and I uh, will uh, provide us with uh, an introduction on the uh, multiphysics simulation of molten salt reactor. So, please, Danny. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, can you still see my slides? Sure. Yes. Okay, because now it's a bit different for me. I also see myself now. So, I it's taking up a lot of the screen, so let me get rid of me. Okay, right. So thank you, Stefano, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so module three, uh, multi-physics uh, simulation of the multi salt reactor. Um, so I will give an intro uh, to this topic of around uh, 45 minutes or so. We have a bit of time for questions. And then afterwards, uh, there's still uh, Stefano and Marco who will give um, some more uh, details about um, how this really works. Um, yeah, so in Delft we have been um, working on multi salt reactors um, and their multi physics simulation for quite a bit of time. Uh, there have been multiple, um, let's say, EU projects on this area. And some of the things that you will see today that I will present and some of the others will present are also, they originate yeah, from these projects. Let's see, I, yeah, okay. So multi-physics uh, in general, uh, you see it uh, everywhere in all kinds of uh, fields. Uh, on the right bottom, of course, there's nuclear, which we're talking about today, but certainly not only in nuclear, you see multi-physics, um, simulations on the top left, for instance, is one of the Dutch Delta works. Uh, fluid structure interaction, of course, plays a big role there. So the computation of the fluids and also the pressure exerted on the structures. Right top of furnace, where you have both chemistry and um, thermal issues playing a role. And left bottom, um, electronic simulation. There, so there, thermal and stress analysis play a big role. So it is really a widespread area, uh, but we are of course mostly interested in uh, in the nuclear part. Okay, so we will discuss mostly the uh, molten salt uh, reactor, and this is then the uh, fast reactor. But I will also show a bit of examples um, from a non-fast uh, system, so a thermal system. Uh, I don't know how to do a pointer in this. Oh, I do see how to do a pointer in this. Uh, laser pointer. Yeah. Okay, so now we have here the, uh, let's say the core of the system with the fuel circuit and below, well, with the primary circuit, of course, where the primary salt is being circulated by a pump. We have an intermediate circuit to transfer the heat to yet another heat exchanger and then an in energy conversion circuit where we extract the actual power. And of course, below the molten salt reactor, we have the draining system, which we will not um, address in this lecture, but which is an important part of the molten salt reactor design. So this lecture will be mostly focused on this area over here. So let's say the core itself. So some of the main topics uh, to be discussed by me today, is some of the physics involved in uh, modeling this system, the complexity associated with this physics and the time scales that play a role. Now we're talking about multi-physics. So we have multiple types of uh, processes ongoing at the same time and they exchange information. So how do you then couple these two pieces of uh, modeling tools together. Some of the uh, advantages and disadvantages, I'll show you how it's practically done. 
Then I'll show you something uh, more application. That's about halfway. Uh, application to the MSRE, so a thermal molten salt reactor, and to the molten salt fast reactor. And I'll end up with some concluding remarks. Okay, so now let's have a talk about the molten salt reactor. What kind of physics do we actually need? What is going on? What do we need models for? Well, it's obvious that we have uh, fluid fuel, so we have to take care of uh, fluid flow and also the precursors uh, from neutron physics, they move around, so we need to take that particularly into account. Most of the time we have complex geometries. As you will see, we get a lot of curves uh, that we have to take care of. So that is, a, that is an important issue. Three-dimensionality, whereas maybe a few years ago, we did things maybe in one or two D, now, of course, we want to do things better, so we tackle things in three dimensions. Heat transfer, as always, in a nuclear reactor system, of course, uh, including their temperature feedback effects on nu uh, nuclear cross sections. But there's also some, maybe some special uh, things ongoing in the molten salt reactor. That is, for instance, the effect that small bubbles have on the system. Uh, bubbles are uh, often used in the system to bubble out certain uh, components in the fuel, so to clean it up. So we need to address how does this bubbling affect, well, maybe the fluid dynamics of this system. Another thing that's very important is the effect of phase change. Now we have a liquid fuel, but in certain scenarios we may have a solidification of the uh, salt in certain regions. So that is also an additional uh, complexity uh, to take into account for molten salt reactors. So what kind of, uh, well, what kind of relevant transients are of interest for such a system uh, outside of the complete steady state modeling, of course, which is also very important, which you always start with if you do multi physics modeling. There are two types of transients that you can superimpose yet on that. And those are, uh, you could categorize them into fuel circuit transients. So everything to do with, let's say, the core and the primary circuit over there. And the second is transient that involves the emergency draining tank. So after uh, the core has been drained or dumped into the draining tanks, what kind of physics do we have going on there? Um, now, I'll show you only a few things from fuel circuit today. Now, this is a list of uh, transients that we have previously investigated um, in some of the EU projects that have been ongoing. Now, for instance, the unprotected loss of heat sink, where you have a reduction in the mass flow rates in the intermediate circuit. So, you're less effective in removing heat from the core. Uh, a loss of uh, fluid flow is another transient. So when this, the, the pump would fail, you would have a, a lack of circulation in the core. So that's yet another uh, initiator. Uh, total loss of power, which is essentially a combination of the above two. Overcooling of the system is another uh, transient that we could look into. So when maybe the pump is out of control or when there's a decrease of temperature in the uh, intermediate circuit. Another category of uh, accidents is, or transients, is um, the insertion of reactivity. So either positive or negative. Now these are all related to the uh, core itself. So let's say the primary sort of circuit and the second, which I will not really discuss, is for the emergency draining system. And you can envision all kinds of transients going on over there. And of course, multiple physics uh, interacting uh, together. Now, let's have a little bit of a chat on uh, neutronics modeling. I'm trying to address a bit here in a couple of these slides the complexity of the problem that we are trying to tackle. Uh, so it is not so much the equations that are important here, 
but it is the magnitude of the problem I'm trying to address. Yeah, for some of you who know neutron transport or neutron diffusion, uh, this will be well known. Uh, for others, that doesn't matter so much. It's the complexity I'm trying to address. So let's say we're doing a neutronics model for the molten salt reactor. Well, what is the order of magnitude of the problem? Well, to model the uh, 3D core, you need about, let's say, 10,000 elements or so to sort of reasonably model the geometry and the physics going on. Um, if we do neutron transport, in practice, you could do maybe eight or 24 angles for the angular dependence of the flux. We have around eight precursors nowadays, fields that we try to solve. Um, well, in Delft, at least, we do uh, finite elements. So we have four basis functions in space and maybe around 10 energy groups or so. That means that the number of degrees of freedom of this system is around 10 million. So that is a large system. And that's only for steady state. So we could also add the time dimension to this, where we time step from beginning to end. So, so this is a large problem. And of course, a cheaper alternative could be to use neutron diffusion, uh, where some of the details are, well, are, let's say, under the carpet. But in general, that will be uh, sufficiently accurate. So there you could win or you could gain a bit of time. Now, for the modeling, it's also important to have a look at some of the time scales that are relevant. Of course, uh, for neutronics, there are two important time scales. One is the prompt time scale, which is short, and one is the reactive period, which hopefully is long. Uh, so there is, well, you could say, a wide range of time scales, perhaps a thousand or so uh, difference between these two. But there's usually no need to really resolve the shortest time scale. So we can sort of sweep that a bit under the carpet in most cases, except for some very special transients, perhaps. Um, so by using neutronics codes that are most of the time implicit in time, or perhaps use the prompt jump approximation, uh, we can have quite large time steps to give, you know, to get a really good model still. Only in some very special transients, you would have the need for small time steps. Now, an important question, of course, for um, neutronics computations or neutronics model modeling is cross-section processing. Now, on the bottom, it says here, it is somewhat of an art. That is true, especially uh, maybe uh, before Monte Carlo was introduced to actually do cross-section processing. It was maybe a bit of a black art. Uh, now with the need or with the uh, with codes like Serpent being available, you can actually quite easily extract cross-sections for your pertinent geometry uh, by using the Monte Carlo code. So that has made life a bit easier. But of course, for the Multiphysics simulation is very important to realize that the cross sections depend on space and time through other parameters, other parameters that come from another type of physics. And so uh, the temperature usually will have to come from a thermal code. And maybe in, in the case of a molten salt fast reactor, that will actually be a CFD type of code that will deliver you the temperature. So you need to. Uh, be aware that you have spatially dependent cross-sections and you need to somehow yeah, cut up your geometry in certain parts. And in practice, of course, not every element or cell will have its own set. That's maybe a bit over the top. That really is not so necessary, but you cut up the geometry in a discrete set of cross-sections. Um, now, and then in the end, uh, you generate cross sections for different sets of temperatures and because you will not process them for all temperatures that are um, possible. And you will make certain intervals of temperature uh, regions and then interpolate your data files to what you actually need. Yeah, 
Now here's a bit of an example of how that is then done. In this case, for a two-dimensional model, the geometry is cut up into these red boxes. And each of these red boxes may still contain many, many computational elements. Um, and it depends on, um, on the type of code that you use. Um, and each of these um, cells has a specific temperature and maybe coming from your computational fluid dynamics model. to a certain cross-section, let's say, region. And you will choose from the files that belong to that region to interpolate your cross-sections for a given temperature. So here files are given for 500 and for 700 and whatnot. And you have actually a temperature of 750. So you would need to interpolate two files to get to the correct temperature. Um, yeah, and that is then usually done in a logarithmic. Uh, fashion. Okay, so that's how that part is taken care of. Now let's go a bit to uh, flow modeling. Uh, maybe a uh, disclaimer here. Uh, I will mostly talk about coupling these two types of physics. Uh, so that is what we have done in the previous, let's say, 10 years or so, most of the time. So we're talking about neutronics coupled with uh, fluid dynamics. Now for uh, the molten salt reactor, as a reactor physicist, to me that is, um, yeah, to me of course that's, that's my area of research. Later I'll mention a couple of other types of physics that of course also play a role uh, and will also be addressed partially by the other two guys. So a bit about the complexity of the flow modeling uh, for the particular uh, the molten salt fast reactor is uh, turbulent flow and so we need uh, our let's say fluid mechanics model but also a turbulence model included with that now you will probably if you're in that field you'll recognize these equations if not not a problem it's about the magnitude of the problem again now it's usually the molten salt reactor takes a bit more uh, let's say spatial resolution if you're talking about the fluid flow so here I've said about 40,000 elements or so. It could also be double of that. Uh, if you put it all together, you get around a, a million or so degrees of freedom, which is still also a substantial number, but was not as uh, su uh, substantial as for the neutron transport. But here also time dependent problem. So time stepping is yet on top of this. So still large problem. Same thing as with the uh, neutron transport or diffusion. Uh, we have several time scales that come into play. Some are short, some are long. We have an interplay of all of these time scales going on. We will not resolve everything, especially because how we, we look at this um, design from somewhat of an engineering uh, point of view. And we will not look at the fundamental turbulence, for instance, in such a reactor. That is not of our interest. We're trying to model the system as a whole. So not all details will be resolved. Okay, so now, now something important as far as multi-physics modeling. So we have, in this case, two types of physics. We have one that is neutron, neutron transport. And the other is computational fluid dynamics. And we need to exchange data between these two pieces of physics. And in practice, these are usually two separate separated codes. And so they, are, they have usually been uh, developed completely separately. So they are used for a certain purpose. And then this comes together in this particular application. Uh, so the molten salt fast reactor. And then you start to worry about how to exchange data. Now, what is being exchanged? Uh, the neutron code will give you uh, flux levels. So it will also give you power densities. And these power densities have to be shared with your computational fluid dynamics code so that it can use that to calculate temperature fields. So power densities go from neutronics to CFD. 
On the other way around, of course, the temperatures come from the computational fluid dynamics, and those have to be taken from there, and that influence the cross sections uh, and how to interpolate the various files. So temperature is taken from the CFD, and you could say it goes to the neutronics via the cross sections. Yeah, so, so things have to be shared, they have to be interpolated and exchanged. Uh, and one complicating factor is that the two codes, uh, like I already mentioned, they do not use the same kind of resolution. So neutronics it can usually be done on a somewhat coarser mesh, whereas the CFD needs a finer mesh. So that makes data exchange just a bit more complicated. Some of the things to keep in mind is uh, con conservation. So you don't want to lose things when you interpolate or when you transfer them to another code. And of course, uh, it's also this, uh, the speed of things. Can this be done efficiently? Now, one of the nice properties is if you make meshes that are actually hierarchic, then it is quite easy to transfer from one to yet another uh, nicely fast and con conservative. Now, so we, uh, we are now going to actually solve this, uh, this problem. And we have two pieces of uh, codes. We have two physics, physics code one, maybe that's the flow. And physics code two, maybe that's the neutronics. And uh, what I have on slide here is the conventional way of doing things. Um, so what we do is we step in time and we're trying to maybe get to the steady state or maybe we're actually doing some kind of a transient case. And how do we actually then go proceed through time? Well, we solve for physics code number one. It gives its input to physics code number two. It updates its corresponding variables. I think it was, uh, I said it was the uh, neutronics. So it will update the power density and the fluxes and all that and the precursor densities. And then we move on to the next time step where it will then transfer its output so it was the power density and the, temp uh, and the uh, yeah, power density to physics code number one again. And this whole process then starts all over and I go to the next time step. So basically there's no, yeah, no, it's, it's a very rudimentary way of sharing data between the two codes. Now this is the most commonly applied and we also do this. Um, and this is, let's say, called loose coupling. Uh, it's super easy to, it's easy to implement. Uh, actually, well, I wouldn't say super easy because in practice, of course, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, you may suffer a bit from stability issues uh, because these codes really are not so tightly coupled together. And so you'll just transfer information from another and then move on. That's what you're doing all the time. So you may have a bit of stability issues if the time steps are very large and also the time accuracy might be uh, yeah, lower than you might want. Okay, well, yeah, let me just go to the next. Another thing that's, uh, well, that's an easy extension of this scheme, which is also often applied uh, which is, well, it's called a tight coupling scheme here. It's essentially the same as the uh, scheme on the on this previous slide, except that we still iterate in one time step. Super easy still to implement, just uh, have a little small loop around it. It might be a bit expensive because you have multiple iterations per time step of both of these codes, and both can be expensive to do. Uh, stability is much increased. Uh, so you can take larger time steps, although at a price of more iteration per time step. So this is well, this is also an often used uh, methodology. Now then towards maybe improved efficiency. Here it gets maybe a bit more, uh, maybe a bit more mathematical approach. Is that within each time? Even in this approach, within each time step, you iterate until you're, let's say, converged, and only then you move on to the next. And so it's it's about getting that process very efficient. Now, this is 
a nonlinear problem in general. It's quite uh, the CFD itself, the fluid mechanics is certainly nonlinear. And coupled to neutronics, the overall problem is also highly nonlinear, especially if there's also turbulence included. And now this uh, just substitution of data in each other by uh, just using the newest available data is a form of what we call PICAR or fixed point iteration, which does tend to work reasonably well, although the convergence is slow. There are some variations on this, uh, maybe that's up for further reading how to accelerate such a uh, yeah, iteration scheme a bit further using Anderson or Aitken acceleration. Not very important right now, so I'll just skip that. Yet even better is to do a complete Newton-like uh, iteration. Now you all know Newton from uh, from solving nonlinear equations. So you take uh, you're trying to solve a system for f is zero. And you, for a given starting point, you at iteration k, you're trying to find a um, yeah, change, an update of that by solving for a first order yeah, Taylor-like uh, problem associated with this. And the nice thing about this is uh, if you're close to the solution, you converge very quickly, so quadratically. But the problem is you require the, the derivative of your system or the Jacobian. And for most, yeah, for most codes, this will not be attainable, especially in the CFD part. It's very difficult to, yeah, to get the derivatives of these systems, especially because you maybe you're not even, you cannot even get into the code. Maybe if you're using a commercial CFD platform, there's no way you're going to get the gradient out. So then these approaches based on Newton are then yeah, lost, you could say, on you. Now, there is one smart, nice trick. Uh, that's maybe a bit more for the uh, mathematically inclined. There is a way of using Newton. Um, and that is called Jacobian free Newton creative of methods. And it's an innovative idea, which already maybe quite a bit of years old, um, but not that widely applied, I would say, for these large industrial-like engineering problems. So the innovative idea combines three issues. One is this Newton uh, method that I explained or touched upon in the previous slide. So you need to linearize and you need to solve that system for your change delta. You're going to do that solution, which is a linear system with a Krilov iterative method. And then there's a smart trick involved. Now, you could say, I cannot, the method is called Jacobian free Newton Krilov. So there's no Jacobian involved, but how can you do Newton if you don't have a Jacobian? That is where the trick comes in. In Krilov methods, so the method how to solve this linear system that you get, you, uh, you need to do matrix factor multiplication. So in this case, this case, the matrix is your Jacobian in red here, J. So the Jacobian has to be applied to a certain vector, whatever that is. But this can be approximated by a change, let's say, of the residual of the system. So that means that uh, you don't actually need the Jacobian itself. You only need to know what the residual of the system is. And that you might be able to get from certain codes if you have some means of manipulation of it. So the Jacobian itself no longer needs to be uh, computed. You only need the residual F to do complete Newton uh, method. Okay, so this is, uh, it is applied, but uh, certainly I've not seen it for multi-salt uh, reactor systems.
Now, there's a bit of a toy problem I uh, once did with uh, with a student. Um, you could, you can, can call anything multi-physics, you could say. That is what this toy problem is all about. I have here a simple yeah, piece of metal, a rod, which has a specific temperature in it. And what I do here in this toy problem is I solve the uh, heat conduction equation. And there's some kind of a source and there's black body radiation, how it cools down. Uh, there's something that drives this particular system. Now, you could say this is one type of physics, but for the toy problem, I've simply cut up the system in two parts. And I call the left part the physics number one and the right part is physics number two. I could do that. Uh, just just another way of looking at multi-physics for this particular problem. Now, there's the exact solution of this. There's temperatures that are oscillating because the temperature on the left and the right are also oscillating. So that, that's what drives this. And then what I did is two solution methods. Uh, one on the bottom left is traditional loose uh, coupling, where you first solve a bit of uh, physics on the left. And then I exchange information at the midway point so I can actually solve the uh, physics on the right, and then I go back to the left again, and, and so forth. And you see that compared to the exact solution, you do get some, yeah, you get some odd behavior uh, in the vicinity of this coupling region. And so if, if your time steps are a bit on the large side for this particular problem, you will see effects of that. So your loose coupling uh, is not as good. On the other hand, if you do this nice method that I just uh, showed you with the Jacobian free, Newton Krilov, then all these artifacts disappear. So, um, yeah, so that's an illustration of how coupling can be done for, in this case, for a single physics problem, but I've made it into a two physics problem. Okay, this is a uh, another uh, example, uh, which is about a molten salt reactor loop. In fact, uh, the two types of physics here are the core, which was modeled by a simple point kinet kinetics model. And the second is, uh, you could say the loop uh, with precursors flowing through this system. Oh, sorry, it's the, uh, oh, this is a bit strange. Let's follow the arrow, it's uh, going clockwise. Um, and heat, heat is being removed in this heat exchanger uh, part. Now in this case, this was also done with this particular uh, Jacobian free Newton method. Um, in this case, it performs nicely stable and efficient, only a few Newton steps per time step, although some hiccups did happen when the time steps were too large. So that also shows you a bit that just to be very nicely robust, sometimes these simple loose coupling methods yeah, are maybe the safe way to go. So this is about the halfway, uh, halfway point. Um, I have told you a bit up to now about how things are done. So how do you actually couple physics together? How are data exchanged? And yeah, what do you need to sort of you know, look out for? Now, in the rest of this uh, talk, I will give you a bit of examples uh, for two systems. One is the uh, molten salt reactor experiment of which here you see uh, two pictures. Uh, so it's the MSRE from Oak Ridge National Lab. And uh, a bit later on, I will show you uh, the molten salt fast reactor system and show you a bit of results on that. And uh, after my talk, uh, so Stefano and Marco, so your two other lecturers, they will talk um, about the molten salt fast reactor only. Okay, so just a bit of. Uh, an example to show you or to illustrate to you how we how this all works. Huh? How do you do multi-physics uh, computation on these kinds of systems? But also, what can you get out of them, and what do you do it for? 
what what's what's the results of it so let's go a bit through this this is work from that we did uh, already i think more than 10 years ago for the msre and so it's a very different design than the molten salt fast reactor uh, we developed a computational scheme uh, for that uh, reactor i think it was one of the first uh, reasonably complex uh, 3D uh, coupling schemes in multi-physics. Uh, so it's time dependent, it is 3D, it is couples neutronics uh, and thermal calculations together. And so it's, yeah, it's mostly what we do, the, those two are the two types of physics. Um, not all is, is known for the MSRE, so the fuel velocity field was uh, taken as an input and it is always uh, parallel to the axis of the core, so uh, vertical. How does this model then look? Um, what we have developed, you see a side view and a top view uh, of this uh, particular system. Um, it's a cylindrical core at that time, of the modeling, so I, like I said, it's quite a bit of years ago. We did not have the capability at that time to actually build that geometry, so we had to do it in X, Y, Z. Now oh, that's uh, a progress, progressing uh, science, of course. Um, it had control rods, this particular system, and they were modeled with albedo boundary conditions. You see in yellow uh, here, fuel salt, um, salt downcomer regions, the control rods are mentioned, and um, yeah, you could say um, the fuel graphite lattice as well. So this was a rudimentary view on how the system actually is modeled in X, Y, and Z. Um, and here is a bit of a zoom in of the system uh, for the thermal design. So this this reactor is basically one large block of graphite with uh, channels for the fuel here donate uh, donated uh, shown as in uh, green uh, they're not exactly of this shape so we had to do some um, assumptions so they're actually a bit rounded off but we made them square just because of the xyz capability only we had to do that so, and then in red, we have the fuel, uh, pure graphite part where heat is conducted through. And of course, uh, the heat is then carried away by the fuel salt itself. So it's also the fission, um, sustains the fission reaction, but of course also carries away the heat um, by flowing. And then these two, these two things are of course coupled. Uh, so you could say there are two types of thermal physics in this problem. One is the graphite conduction, and one is um, convection of heat through the uh, fuel channels. So, and on top of that, we have still neutronics. So you could say there's sort of three, three things uh, put together, but two, two of the three is the same kind of physics, and one is a really different type of physics. Now, this will reasonably be big, a big problem as well uh especially for uh maybe uh more than over 10 years ago so this has also over a hundred uh, over a million uh unknowns only for the thermal uh, uh thermal part and it's transient so it's time dependent now here you see a bit of the yeah the computational scheme uh written out in full you could say there's two two large codes being involved. One is called Dalton here. That is a neutron diffusion code. So what goes in is cross sections, XS. What comes out is a power density P and that is on the neutronics mesh. So, but I need the power density on the thermal mesh. So it has to be converted in grid. So that is, has to do with this data exchange. I was referring to a few slides earlier. And you need to, yeah, Exchange data it has to be in the right format and the right grid. So that's being done. Um, on the left hand side, we have the thermal code. So thermal diffusion in the graphite and flow in the channels. Um, it needs the power density, of course. 
from uh, from Dalton. Out comes the temperature. Um, it's also grid converted because you need to have you have certain regions, like I said, certain regions have the same cross sections or the same data libraries connected to them. So they need to uh, you need to convert them in that sense. Um, so you do an interpolation step for your cross section library files. You get the correct cross sections that you actually need for the specific temperature. And they are then again exchanged with Dalton. So that's how data is being exchanged back and forth every single time step. So this is sort of a practical scheme, um, how you can do transient analysis of a system. Now, a, a typical example that people always show for the molten salt reactor experiment is the effect of flow. So initially here, we start with a reactor that was stationary. So there was no fuel flow, no pump was on, and it was stationary. And the power was only a one watt, around one watt which means that there is no thermal feedback because power is so incredibly low. So what happens now if we turn on the pump instantly? Well, it's not instantly, of course, you see the flow rate here increase, but it increases in a few seconds. Here in 10 seconds to about full, uh, full power. Then the solid line is the actual power of the reactor. You see that decreases vastly and then oscillates. Now that can be explained, and that's one of the nice things about uh, what kind of physics is going on in the molten salt reactor. That is that the neutral precursors move with the flow, and because the neutron precursors decay at some point, they can leave that particular neutron at a certain location. And if the neutron is released outside of the core region, that's lost. So. And in that sense, you lose reactivity. So a fuel system that is stationary has a higher reactivity than a system where the pump is on because you might lose some neutrons. And so your chain reaction is less effective. And that's what you see here. So that's why the power is going down. And you see the oscillations simply because it's a uh, fuel circuit. So Precursors are coming back into the core again, and they go out and they go back in. So that's what's causing this oscillation. Here also a bit more uh, graphic, uh, how the precursors move. Uh, so that's really the driving force of this problem. Here for T is zero up to T is 30 for one of the precursor groups with the longest uh, life. You see for T0, everything was stationary. So you get a sort of a blob in the core itself and something excluded from the center. That's because of the control rods. Now the pump has started, things start to move out, out of the core and at some point move back in again uh, because of the recirculation of, um, yeah, of the fluid and therefore also of the precursors. Uh, so this is a supporting uh, graph of what I just explained, why you see this oscillatory behavior. So that's one, uh, one thing that you can do with this, uh, this kind of code. Uh, here's some, some static, uh, static pictures for the MSRE. Uh, top view and a side view, maybe not so noteworthy. You see the control rod effect, of course, on the center. Uh, temperatures. Uh, both of the moderator, so the graphite, and of the fuel. And that's something quite interesting about if you zoom in a bit uh, for uh, this molten salt uh, reactor. And that is that if you, uh, this is a zoom in of the temperature field uh, with a couple of graphite blocks and uh, a fuel channel here. Here's a fuel channel, and here's a fuel channel. Now you normally, of course, expect that the fuel is always the hottest, uh, the hottest region of your reactor. But here, that's quite the opposite. It's the graphite that's the hottest. 
That is because, of course, here the fuel channel also removes the heat. Now, why are the graphite blocks hotter than uh, than than the, than the salt fuel? That is because there's also still gamma heating in the graphite block. So there's some deposition of heat in the graphite, which then needs to diffuse out to watch a channel, and then it can be removed. So that's, well, if you, if you haven't seen that before, then uh, yeah, it's a bit unusual. But this has these multi-physics computations uh, can give you full details uh, on all of this. So here even per channel, and all of the graphite that's in between of in between those those channels. Now this was a steady state problem. Uh, so how does it just behave normally? But what's more interested or more interesting, and what multi physics codes can be really used for is is some kind of an accident scenario. And in this particular case, we investigated the a debris incident of the uh, some some channels some salt channels are being blocked now that would of course mean that locally the cooling is less effective so you would expect that part of the core to heat up uh, but heating up also would cause more thermal feedback so you would have uh, you would have a drop of power as a whole which you already see with these numbers here. Now you see in this figure here that indeed in this part where the fuel channels are blocked, that you see higher temperatures occurring. And then uh, this heat, of course, is then slowly diffused out by the graphite. So that is really where the usefulness of these codes uh, come into play. Uh, so certain scenarios that you can uh, try to cook up yourself or uh, depending on how realistic they might be and then uh, pull them through your multi-physics simulation to see what happens. Okay, then a few slides I have on the molten salt uh, fast reactor. I will not spend too much time on that because Marco and Stefano will also talk about this in a bit more detail. Um, so some of the results I will show you are from various projects that we have been into. Uh, one of them is EVO, the other is SamoForce, uh, SamoSafer is of course running at this moment. And even before EVO, there were other European projects in this area. Okay. So later on, you'll get the more detailed view on the molten salt fast reactor model. This is a bit the modeling as it was, let's say, uh, well, maybe six, six years ago or something. So we have a bit of a gradual increase in capabilities. At that time, we used to do, we used to model these systems as two dimensional. So because they were axisymmetric, you could almost say. So we modeled them as RZ systems. So where the circumferential or azimuthal angle was of no importance. So, and then at that time, type of modeling that we used uh, sort of looked like this. So the primary circuit here is in yellow. Um, salt is being pumped by pumps over here through the core, uh, where of course the fission reaction is most prominent. It would heat up and then would, would exchange energy here uh, in the heat exchange. And then here's the fertile uh, fertile blanket, which was not really modeled in these systems very well. And so this is an RZ, RZ system. So this is just a uh, pie shape, you could say. Now computational mesh, maybe not, uh, not that interesting. Again, at that time, not a whole lot of capability yet. Uh, simple Cartesian-like uh, geometries, whereas at this moment, so the latest results we'll show later on, are uh, yeah, much more detail detailed than this. Again, we did a coupling here of computational fluid dynamics and uh, neutronics. In this case, it was diffusion. So again, those two types of physics. 
uh, a very general coupling scheme. Again, this Dalton MSR, which I already mentioned before, uh, which is maybe a bit of a different version though, uh, which can handle the MSFR uh, pool type uh, geometry. Uh, so this does neutron diffusion. And then on the left, we have a code that does the thermal part. In this case, it also needed to do, of course, flow in the core, which is a bit different from the MSRE as a system where you have real channels. So channel modeling is much easier than actually doing thermal modeling of a bath of salt, right, which actually can flow. Now, things are being exchanged as usual. Of course, power density has to be exchanged. Temperature has to be exchanged because of the cross sections and cross sections then input the uh, diffusion code. Well, some special things about, of course, also the velocity field because you have to transport precursors and turbulence viscosity in this case. And here, a number of data libraries at very specific either regions or temperatures that can then be interpolated or mixed to the correct cross sections. Now, the type of results that you can get out of this here again, first you always do a steady state. Here are velocity fields uh, for the complete system. And you see a large, large recirculation in the primary core zone. And uh, uh, ultimately, of course, it's compacted through the uh, pump and heat exchanger region and it goes back into the, let's say, main core region again. Of course, you also get power densities and steady state temperatures of the salt from this. Uh, you probably have seen many of these pictures already before, but from these kinds of codes, those pictures originate. Now, and then here too, uh, well, last part about the steady states, uh, precursors are always such a yeah, peculiar uh, item for molten salt reactors. And that's why I have the mirror slide. On the left, the uh, longest living precursor group. So with the smallest lambda, you see that's almost a homogeneous um, concentration just because it gets well mixed. It has the time to mix. On the right is the shortest living group, so with the biggest lambda. And there you see that it is much more closely resembled by the power density itself. It doesn't have much time to convect yet. So there's a balance between production and local decay. And then, of course, there are precursor groups that are somewhere in between where all types of physics plays a role. Now, and of course, these things can then be nicely explained if you also have them because you also have the velocity fields. Now, one of the things you can then do with the MSFR is particular types of transients, and that's where this really comes into play, multi-physics modeling. So it's the results you're interested in. Now, this is one scenario where the pump fills, um, either instantly, or here it's a little decay, an exponential decay uh, within a, a, uh, with a time scale of five seconds. And what you can do with this is, can this core still keep itself, let's say, cooled? So you start your uh, multi-physics computation from a steady state. You start your uh, uh, ramping down the flow rate of the pump over those five seconds, and you compute on and see what happens to the system, including all of the physics. So including neutrons, including flow. Now, it turns out that in this particular case, that um, after, in this case, 130 seconds, you almost reach a steady state. And it is purely a um, buoyancy. So gravity, dri gravity drives the flow uh, up to a steady state, but the flow rate is much lower, about a factor six, lower than it was when you had the pump still on. So it turns out this system can still um, be very safe um, on pure free convection alone. And so this is the kind of thing the multi-physics code is useful for, right, to tell you that result. 
Now, last, uh, the last slide before I get to the conclusion. Um, and this has to do with the fact that, now what do you use multi-physics codes for? One thing I hope I have illustrated is that these multi-physics codes packages are very expensive. They use a lot of time to run. So if you do, for instance, a um, three-dimensional MSFR core with some particular transients, that might take you days. Now, the question is, uh, then what? Can you do even more uh, with it than, than just compute a particular uh, transients that you want? How do you then, can you do this maybe for design purposes? Because then it becomes so incredibly expensive to do if you need to rerun your code all the time. Is there then not a solution for that? Or another issue is uh, uncertainty quantification. You also need to run this multi-physics code often to get good uncertainty quantification. But how is that in agreement with the fact that these codes are so expensive to run? Now that brings me to this topic of this slide. So. Uh, on top of multi-physics modeling, we now also do a lot of reduced order modeling where we try to uh, reduce the cost of these large multi-physics packages uh, to only a fraction of the cost, but without losing too much uh, of the quality of the actual multi-physics or high fidelity solution. Now, there are very special methods for to do that. Maybe that is not for today. But so I'm just trying to tell you that multi-physics modeling itself is not the final word. Still on top of that, there's still a lot of work to do uh, when you have to do design or uncertainty quantification. And so as an example here, um, uh, you can get by building a reduced model or the model of a multi-physics system, you can actually do uncertainty quantification. In this case, this EDF apparently is not even Gaussian. And so the raw model in blue here was done compared with the reference by simply sampling very expensive to do uh, but you do see that one of the results is that you can go from one and a half hour this was for a small uh, simple multi salt uh, problem from one and a half hour to only a millisecond so um, multi-physics modeling is not the last uh, words let's say some of the conclusions of uh, today uh, if you're talking about the molten salt reactor, which is of course what this, yeah, you could say, uh, school is about, uh, there are high fidelity code systems available. Uh, Henry Lan has its own uh, PSI, CNRS, KIT, Delft. Uh, there are multiple of these packages around. Um, some are completely 3D, some are a bit different. But, but they are uh, available. And the, what is a nice conclusion about the last few years is that the realism of these simulations has grown quite a bit. So what I've shown you in this lecture was maybe results uh, deliberately from maybe a bit back in time, just to give you a bit of contrast with uh, what Stefano and Marco will show you uh, a bit later on uh, after me. There does a uh, a definite increase in quality over the last uh, couple of years. This multi-physics modeling is definitely a uh, very important tool if you want to investigate the safety of the MSR. Also, I've shown you just a few results on transient analysis, for instance, the pump, a pump that stops, uh, but we have done many more of these. And the multi-physics models can really tell you yeah, what comes out? What happens to your maximum temperature? What happens to the flow rate? Where is the highest temperature? Well, things like that. Of course, 
uh, it is still a large problem. Uh, it's it's an immense computational problem, it says here. That, that's definitely the case. That's why reduced order modeling is so interesting. And to end up with is that, uh, yeah, there's more to come. Um, I've shown you only things of coupling, flow, and neutronics, basically. Uh, so thermal, flow, things like that. But, of course, you can think of many other things uh, that are also important for the multi salt reactor. Chemistry, for instance, or structural analysis of certain parts of the reactor where perhaps you have thermal, thermally driven uh, fatigue. So there's much more to it than just neutronics and um, CFD, or flow. Okay, yeah, some of the publications, maybe uh, if you're interested, you can always, of course, look up uh, my name. That's uh, probably uh, the common factor between most of this. Uh, there's also a site at TU Delft where you can find, uh, for instance, all kinds of theses. So, because also, of course, uh, all kinds of master thesis uh, students um, have contributed to this work and they are just freely downloadable. So I think that was it for me. And then, uh, so thank you all. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so thanks, uh, thanks Stefano for the, for the introduction. And uh, as he said, uh, this second part will be sort of complementary to the first one, uh, the first lecture done by Danny, because uh, we move a little bit forward in time uh, and focus on this, uh, uh, the focus of this of this lecture will be of this presentation will be like showing you um, two examples of multiphysics tools developed uh, in SAMFAR, which is the previous uh, project, European project, uh, and which are still being developed during some safer and some examples of applications and what uh, what these codes have been uh, used for, uh, especially in the uh, analysis of the MSFR, because that's the that's that's the most important thing. Eh? So you have to, um, well, the, the goal, the ultimate goal of these tools uh, is to um, analyze in uh, more precisely and with a greater uh, level of reality the um, MSFR, the molten salt fast reactor. So then you already gave a, a, a brief description of the reactor. So I'm going to go quite quickly here, but the key things to uh, remember is that uh, uh, in the MSFR, the current design of the MSFR, um, it's quite uh, complex from the geometry point of view. And here I'm always focusing on the core because this is uh, uh, where the uh, multiphysics code, I mean, this is the part of the reactor, the multiphysics codes address. And the MSFR core is, um, is a torus. So it's quite complex, a three-dimensional shape. Uh, from which 16 identical sectors depart. Each sector is a, is a recirculation loop in which you can find a pump and then you find a heat exchanger and then there's the uh, inlet and outlet legs. And on top of this, you have a blanket, a, a radial blanket where uh, fertile salt is placed, which serves, of course, also as a radial reflector. And then there, is, there are the axial reflectors, the top and the bottom ones. And uh, of course, the key feature of this reactor is that there is liquid fuel, it's a thorium uranium, but it's also the coolant. And this gives the MSFR uh, very promising characteristics in terms of safety, sustainability, proliferation resistance. And here you find listed uh, just a couple of them. Of course, the salt is liquid, uh, there cannot be meltdown, it can be drained uh, in case of emergencies. One of the key features is that it has a strong negative temperature feedback about minus 5 PCM per Kelvin, which makes it uh, very stable and uh, uh, controllable by a temperature gradient. Uh, since the salt uh, has a low vapor pressure, uh, the entire system works uh, at quite low pressures compared to standard uh, uh, light water reactors, which makes the entire system safer and cheaper. And in the end, as the fuel uh, can be recirculated and can be uh, treated uh, from the chemical point of view, the uh, actinides, uh, transuranic elements can be recirculated uh, until uh, they are burned. So you have a better fuel recirculation, fuel utilization. Um, 
But in any case, so this is just the, the design and the concept behind it. But uh, the truth is that uh, this, uh, this design is still preliminary. And uh, given the absence of, uh, can I say also, uh, experience with these reactors, because uh, in the end, uh, the one of the few reactors that has been, molten salt reactors that have been realized uh, and operated is the MSFE, which is quite different uh, uh, design from, from this one. Uh, the thing is that you need to perform a uh, huge research effort to performing uh, numerical simulations in order to bring this design to a higher technology readiness uh, level. But simulating this kind of system, we've seen it already in the first lecture, it's quite tricky. And in particular, the MSFR. Uh, just to well, summarize the most peculiar uh, physics phenomena and complex physics phenomena to model in this kind of reactors. Uh, here you see a list. So you, of course, have always the uh, precursors drift by the liquid fuel, which tightens the couple, the coupling between uh, um, um, neutronics and, and uh, fluid dynamics. Then you also have, uh, of course, a non-uniform heat generation inside the coolant, which is not to be found in other reactors. You might find a certain power distribution also inside, for example, the outer loop, the pumps and the heat exchanger. And this changes the, for example, the dynamics of natural circulation. This, you need to have a simulation tool that it's able to take that into account and model it correctly. Uh, as mentioned by, by Danny before, also a helium bubbling system is foreseen, uh, both for reactivity control and also to um, enhance the uh, gaseous fission products removal. But then, of course, you, you might need to uh, model helium bubbles inside the salt, so you need a two-phase uh, solver. Um, you need also, in some cases, to take into account the compressibility of the mixture, because that plays a role, especially in super prompt critical transients. And then, as I already said, the, comp the, the, the core shape uh, it's quite complex, which means that you need codes that are able to take into account uh, to, to, mm, 3D, three dimensional effects uh, and to simulate uh, uh, turbulent flows effects because the Reynolds number of the salt flowing in the cavity uh, is around 10 to the fifth. So it's quite high and quite turbulent. And so uh, definitely we've already seen this, uh, uh, we already uh, Right, to the conclusion that a multi-physics approach is uh, needed. But what's important is that it's very difficult to use uh, legacy codes uh, that are well, let's say, well, 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 uh, well established and uh, um, codes and, and numerical schemes that are well established and largely used uh, in, the, um, in the nuclear community and in the nuclear industry because most of them um, are dedicated to light water reactors, whose characteristics are quite different from the MSFR. Which means that to model this kind of reactor, we need uh, to develop new multiphysics tools or extend new ones. And indeed, in this presentation, I'm going to give a, uh, we, we are going to give a, a, an example of two codes. Starting from the code uh, most recently developed at Q Delft, uh, this was the, the topic, the main topic of my uh, PhD uh, work there. And here you see the numerical scheme of uh, the TODAPT multiphysics code. It's made of two blocks, two main blocks coupled together. One is Digiflows, that is the CFT code, and the other one is Phantom, the neutronics. And here I listed the, the equations the main equations behind the, the CFD solver, which is an incompressible runs solver coupled to the K epsilon model. But I'm not going to go into the details of this. Eh? So uh, I just put them here uh, for you also for future reference. And in any case, if you're interested, you can find all the information uh, on the uh, um, scientific publication that I linked, uh, the link here. The important things is that Digiflows to solve, as I said, the incompressible runs equations. I wrote here the compressible runs because these are the equations implemented in the code, but we've seen that for the MSFR, we can, under certain circumstances, let's say, study of steady state conditions and most of the transients adopt 
the incompressible approximation, which means that also the buoyancy force uh, is uh, uh, modeled by uh, the Businesk approximation. Then here you see the K and epsilon equations uh, in a little bit different form than what you might be used to, uh, to see because uh, they are written in logarithmic form. They are cast into a logarithmic form uh, in order to always preserve from the numerical point of view the positivity both of the turbulent kinetic energy and of the dissipation of of turbulent kinetic energy, which of course from the physical point of view they have to be positive, but numerically, especially when adopting a finite element discretization, they might become negative in certain regions. And then, so this is just to, to describe the, the in, in, a, in a nutshell the, the CFD code, and then the phantom code, as the name suggests, is an SN code, so it's a multi-group transport solver, which can solve both the steady state and transient neutron uh, equations. By steady state, I mean that um, we solve uh, eigenvalue problems, of course. So you would need to, in this case, uh, divide the fission uh, production by, by the eigenvalue K, both here in the front equations and, and in, the, uh, in the transport, in the delayed neutron precursors equation. But there's an extra equation implemented in the code, which is this one. Uh, it's, uh, it's a standard transport equation and it models the decay heat. Why? Because this is another thing that has to be taken into account in the molten salt reactors. Decay heat uh, derives from, the, um, de derives from a certain budget of energy which is uh, uh, inside fission products and, it's with, and that is emitted with a certain delay in time usually. But in the multi cell reactors, as these fission products are driven by the flow, there is also a space delay which needs to be taken into account because, as I already said, there might be a certain power density um, distribution due to decay heat inside, for example, the heat exchange, the heat exchanger, um, which you need to take into account. And uh, in Phantom, there is also a routine that uh, uh, deals with the cross-section corrections, with the temperature, and uh, for example, it can work with uh, uh, one single library at a reference temperature and apply both the density and the Doppler uh, corrections like this, or it can work with uh, several libraries of different temperatures, which are then um, interpolated uh, depending on the temperature of the salt in a certain location. So this is the code in a nutshell, and of course these two codes are coupled together, and by coupling, coupling together in this case, uh, we implemented a loose coupling approach, so the two codes uh, exchange data. Uh, the, fission, the fission power is of course transferred from the neutronics code to the, to the CFT one, which in turn um, transfers the information of temperature on each element and then velocity and the turbulent viscosity to the neutronics code because for example velocity and the turbulent viscosity play a role in the uh, solution of the precursors equation transport equation in terms of the main novelties of this uh, of this code well one thing is that it implements uh, a full transport neutronics model um, most of um, MSR tools, MSR um, numerical uh, codes uh, uh, up to a few years ago implemented the diffusion uh, neutronic solvers, which are good enough for an MSFR, but looking ahead in time, you might want to model certain transients, certain situations in which uh, um, heterogeneities in the core start to become uh, relevant, for example, draining transients, uh, transients involving uh, the blanket, uh, uh, transients involving malfunctions of the helium bubbling system, for example, so where you might have large bubbles of helium, and uh, uh, so all situations in we all kind of situations in which uh, having a full transport model might play a role, uh, given the, um, for example, given the low beta effective of this uh, of this reactor, uh, because you already have uh, uh, the, the precursor drift which decrease normal beta effective. 
Another uh, interesting aspect of this code it has it's that uh, from the spatial discretization point of view, it's fully based on the, dis on the discontinuous alerting finite element method. And uh, for those of you who are not very familiar with this, um, basically it's it's a finite element method which uh, uh, has in which the um, polynomial basis expansion of the of your unknowns allows for discontinuities across the elements. So the basis functions are discontinuous, as you can see on this picture. Uh, and for this, you need to adopt certain volume of certain numerical fluxes across the elements. And in this, the DG method resembles a little bit the finite volumes. And in such a way also, um, how can I say, it combines sort of the, the, the benefits and the pros of both finite volumes and standard finite elements. Um, and it allows for high geometrical flexibility. And we can work with both structured and structured meshes. It can, um, uh, it allows for local refinement, both in, in mesh and in the polynomial order of the basis functions. Uh, definitely leads to high accuracy and, and it's very robust. And it's also very uh, suitable and uh, for, for an efficient parallelization. And from the temporal discretization point of view, this is just uh, uh, for you to know, the method is, uh, the, the code is, uh, implements a fully second order implicit uh, uh, backward difference formula scheme. Um, this second order uh, time uh, discretization is uh, time accuracy is guaranteed by the fact that the uh, fields exchanged between the codes are properly extrapolated to preserve uh, the, uh, the so-called non-linear consistency between the codes. So even if we iterate, we preserve the second order implicit, uh, uh, the second order time accuracy. And now let's move to the, well, to, to, to some applications to, I mean, what, what I used for this code uh, during my PhD, which means uh, uh, the analysis of the MSFR steady state and some transients, because that's the, the ultimate goal, assess the safety, the reliability uh, of the reactor, and also, in, in, I mean, on the other hand, also try to uh, find weak points, if there are, uh, and uh, derive useful, um, it's a useful information for the further development of the design of this reactor. So what we've done is to study the steady state conditions of the reactor imposing a total power of three gigawatts and an average salt temperature of about 700 degrees Celsius. And we simulated the reactor by just considering one sixteenth of, uh, of, it, of the core. Because uh, if you remember, there are 16 identical sectors, so you can actually simulate only one, imposing reflect, reflective boundary conditions at the edges of this wedge. Um, and here you see uh, the, the geometry. So this is the core, this is the toroidal core, axial reflectors, this is the blanket portion, and then you have one recirculation loop, outer leg, inlet leg, and then you have the pump and the heat exchanger active, uh, active region. Unfortunately, uh, at, the time of the, at the time of the simulations, the, uh, the design specifications for both the pump and the heat exchangers were a bit lacking. And for this reason, we just simulated the pump uh, as, uh, as a momentum force, uh, adjusting the pump head um, in order to reach uh, the um, design uh, specification of uh, uh, 4.5 meter cube per second uh, of volumetric flow rate. And uh, as far as the heat exchanger is concerned, uh, we simulated it with a porous medium approach, uh, adjusting um, friction factor and the volumetric heat transfer coefficient in order to impose the uh, four bar pressure losses, uh, uh, which are design specification, and also in order to reach a minimum salt temperature of 650 degrees at the exit of the, of the heat exchanger. And the heat exchanger, I mean, the secondary circuit is not modeled, and we just considered the, like an intermediate average salt temperature of uh, uh, 635 uh, degrees Celsius. So basically, you have to think that uh, the, uh, the primary salt exchanges heat uh, in a volumetric fashion inside this, uh, this sort of black box. 
And here you see a table with the with the properties uh, uh, with the salt properties uh, uh, considered. So this is the salt composition. It's a thorium, uh, lithium uh, fluorides uh, with the uranium and also some transuranium elements. This is the density, uh, temperature dependent viscosity, thermal expansion coefficient because we adopted the Businesc approximation, and uh, the melting point, uh, 850, uh, 850 degrees. Whereas here on the on the right you see an example of the uh, of the mesh that I used for my simulations with a, um, a refined layer uh, next to the next to the reactor walls in order to better model the uh, boundary layer the flow boundary layer. But for electronics simulations, this local refinement uh, is not uh, is not used because it's not it's not necessary. The the, the wall region is uh, is a region of low importance neutral importance. So this, uh, this is an example of results that I, that I obtained. This is the steady state analysis. So on the, on the left, you see the velocity field. Uh, the background color is, uh, is the speed, whereas arrows indicate the direction of the salt. Whereas on the right, you have the temperature, the salt temperature distribution. So you see that the, the, the salt temperature increases actually across the, across the core as expected. Uh, but not in an um, axial uniform way. So you do have uh, a certain radial uh, gradient, uh, which means that in the end, the maximum salt temperature is not to be found at the entrance of the heat exchanger in this, uh, in this uh, reactor, but it's found uh, at the top of the reactor um, in contact with the upper reflector, where the fluid, uh, where the, the salt, uh, the fluid is almost stagnant. Another interesting thing to notice uh, is that uh, there is a recirculation region inside the reactor. There is a boundary detachment, detachment but uh, this does not lead to local hotspots. So, on, from this point of view, it's uh, well, it's good. There is no safe uh, safety, uh, let's say, concern. But uh, this leads to um, definitely to pressure losses, which should be uh, avoided. The one conclusion that we derived from this analysis is that the shape of the reactor, uh, of, the, uh, of the cavity uh, of the reactor, should be adjusted in such a way that such recirculations are avoided. And another thing to take into account is that there is also quite a large temperature gradient uh, uh, in contact with the, with the upper reflector, which means that it might be subject to high uh, thermal uh, stresses. And this might be must must be taken into account. Here you see the power distribution. The power distribution is quite is quite simple. Eh? You would say that in uh, in axial it's quite it's almost a cosine, and radially it's almost a, a vessel function. Uh, so it's almost like as if this reactor is a is a is a simple uh, cylindrical reactor. Um, but it's also interesting to see here that there is no zero power. So there is a power density everywhere, even in the heat exchanger region. This is due to the, uh, for example, this is due to the, to the decay heat also and to the fission products distribution, to the salt distribution in the system. Uh, what is interesting to see is that the, uh, in the MSFR, there is no problem in having such large power gradients and non uniform, you know, in, in light water reactors, you typically want to have flat profiles here it doesn't matter because the flow, um, because the salt is recirculated, so this uh, uh, ensures uh, quite homogeneous uh, um, burn up. If you uh, yeah, fuel, fuel burn up, and then you don't have also safety requirements in terms of power maximum power gradients because you don't have uh, uh, like solid fuel pins uh, uh, on which you need to uh, to have a certain maximum. Uh, uh, heat flux, otherwise you reach, uh, I don't know, uh, boiling crisis and stuff, and stuff like that. Um, one thing that we derived uh, out of this analysis is that the, one, one thing that we saw is that the K-effective uh, is almost 1000 PCM above criticality, which means that the, uh, well, the geometry of the reactor or the um, salt composition, the salt, uh, um, the, the, the concentration of fissile fuel inside the, the, the salt should be decreased a little bit. Then we move to uh, 
Ah, no, before before moving to the to the transit, I also wanted to show you the an example of a, a delayed neutron precursors distribution. We have already seen this uh, in the first lecture regarding the old geometry of the MSFR, and here we see we we, we can derive the same conclusion. So, fission products uh, delay neutron precursors, which have the largest lifetime, are uh, well feel more the flow field, so their distribution is quite heterogeneous, quite different from the uh, power distribution, power density distribution, whereas fission products, uh, uh, the late neutral precursors, which uh, decay quite quickly, then do not really feel the flow field, and they're so that the di their distribution is not very distorted from the, from the fission power density distribution. And another thing is that basically we don't have uh, uh, fast decaying fission products uh, uh, outside the core, whereas the concentration of the late neutral precursors uh, in the first family is quite uniform, it's quite homogeneous uh, everywhere in the everywhere in the core, in the in the primary circuit. Let's move then to uh, some transient analysis that we performed, because yes, okay, we derived useful information. Uh, uh, out of the steady state analysis, we also wanted to study the dynamics uh, of the reactor, how the reactor behaves in certain uh, um, emergency situations, in certain transient situations. For example, we ask ourselves uh, what happens if we have a quite fast reduction in the cooling capabilities uh, of the reactor. We uh, decreased uh, in 15 seconds uh, the uh, power extracted uh, from the heat exchanger uh, up to 20% of the nominal value. What happened is shown by these plots. So at first, uh, the, um, the, 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 the salt average temperature increases because, of course, you have a mismatch between the power produced and the power extracted in the reactor. But then you have to remember in these kind of reactors that you have a very strong uh, uh, temperature feedback coefficient, and so the increase in the average uh, um, salt temperature leads to a quite fast decrease of the reactor power, which in, in like 10 seconds drops to almost 20%, 30% of its, of its nominal value. And this, of course, inverts the trend of the average temperature. Uh, what we are interested in normally in these uh, in these scenarios is uh, uh, whether the maximum salt temperature increases and reaches possibly uh, dangerous uh, uh, values for the, uh, for, for the for the for the integrity of the structural material. Well, you see that in in these kind of scenarios there is absolutely no uh, issue regarding the maximum salt temperature because it follows quite nicely the trend of the of the power. And the, the reason behind this is that there is a, an increased, uh, sorry, a, uh, yes, uh, a decreased power to flow ratio, which means that the um, power, the temperature gradients inside the reactor are decreased. So the salt temperature homogenizes, as shown by this, uh, by this video, which is not real time, it's like five times accelerated. So after almost 80 seconds, uh, a new steady state uh, is reached, uh, steady state is reached, so in these kind of scenarios there is basically no threats for the reactor, which can actually follow quite nicely the power extracted. Another scenario that we analyzed is the opposite. So what happens if we quickly increase the power extracted from the heat exchanger? This happens, for example, when you have a certain malfunctioning in the energy conversion circuit, might be a depressurization of the circuit, or in the secondary circuit. So what happens, for example, when we quickly, in three seconds, decrease the intermediate salt temperature by 50, 50 Kelvin? Well, of course, you, might, you need a rapid increase. You, you, uh, you, you have a rapid increase of the fission power because um, you have, uh, I mean, when, when the salt starts to be cooled more in the heat exchanger, then this salt moves, and then you have a, a blob, let's say a blob of cold salt that enters the core, 
and increases the reactivity because of the strong negative uh, uh, feedback, which leads uh, to a quite rapid increase of the power to five gigawatts in like three, in like five, five or 10 seconds. But then this increases the uh, temperature gradients across the core because of the increased power to flow ratio. And this inverts the trend of the average salt temperature, which then arrives to a new steady state. So also in this case, quite quickly, after only 30 seconds, a new steady state is reached without any safety concern, also because the minimum salt temperature in this case, it's uh, above 30, 35 degrees, uh, the, uh, the solidification temperature. One last example of transients that I, of transient that I want to show you is the loss of flow transient, uh, which can happen, for example, in a, in a case of malfunction of the fuel pump. And we simulated it with a uh, coast down, uh, having a five seconds time constant. And the main goal of this kind of simulation is always uh, is are the temperature gradients across the primary circuit enough to sustain uh, uh, natural convection, which can, well, of course, remove enough the heat uh, from the core. Well, we found that that's not the case for the current design of the MSFR because at the end of the of the simulation performed, uh, after 30 seconds, you have almost uh, a steady state condition in which uh, the natural convection is uh, uh, well, in which the flow rate uh, is only 6.5% of the nominal value, which means that uh, there is definitely not enough natural convection to remove uh, all the heat from the uh, from the system. And so, and not one uh, important uh, conclusion that we derived uh, um, is that the current MSFR design must be improved uh, from the point of view of pressure losses inside the primary circuit. Before uh, leaving the floor to Stefano, I just want to say that, uh, of course, there are going on developing works uh, inside the, the field of the multiphysics tool. In particular, uh, currently, um, phase change model is being implemented because uh, that's one of the physics phenomena that you need to take into account for a more realistic uh, uh, simulation of uh, MSFR, uh, for example, uh, accidental conditions. You might think uh, uh, of an overcooling transient in which the uh, salt inside the heat exchanger is cooled uh, so much that locally it can freeze it, it can reach the solidification temperature, so it can freeze and so you need to take this into account because uh, there is also uh, related to this a restriction, I mean, this leads to a restriction of the um, uh, flow area. Uh, and all sorts of phenomena that need that needs to take to be taken into account. In uh, inside DigiFlows, this has been uh, uh, implemented uh, with a uh, with a linearized entropy approach. So this is the way the phase change is modeled. Um, and since in DigiFlows uh, we solve for the entropy uh, and not in terms of the of the temperature, the nonlinear entropy temperature coupling is solved uh, in an iterative way using using a set of newton of newton iterate of newton iterations and uh, and then when having a, a phase change when have yeah, phase change uh, simulations you also need to introduce an extra term in the in the navier stokes equations to take into account the non slip condition uh, at the solid liquid interface and this is an example of uh, uh, tests that have been performed on uh, uh, 1D analytical benchmarks and uh, uh, simple uh, 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 benchmark cases, uh, including, for example, the, the melting of an octadecane in a square enclosure or the melting of a gallium in a rectangular enclosure. So in all these cases, uh, results are very promising. There is a quite nice uh, uh, agreement with the uh, experimental results and the between the, the numerical results and the experimental ones. So that's it from from me, and I leave the floor now to to Stefano.
Thank you. So I will take the presenter role. Okay. So this one. Can you see the screen right? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So um, then uh, let's move to uh, another uh, tool that has been developed during the past project uh, inside the, uh, let's say, some of them, some safer project, which is uh, uh, the one developed in, uh, in Politecnico di Milano based on uh, the OpenFOAM toolkit. So OpenFOAM is a, a C++ toolkit uh, which uh, uh, allows you to solve uh, a numerical problem uh, in uh, continuous mechanics, basically helps you in solving a partial differential equation. Um, the, the, the reason for, uh, for, for using this, this tool uh, is uh, relies on the fact that uh, for sure one, the, the first, uh, let's say, advantage is the, the, the open, it's open source. So, we can easily share uh, among us the, um, the result and the solver that we develop with this toolkit. Then, uh, as the name said, so open, open source and form, which means field operation and manipulation, it allows to, uh, let's say, to, it allows you to have all the uh, tools that are required for solving this kind of problem, starting from the creation of the geometry, the creation of the mesh, the visualization of the result, all the numerical scheme that uh, uh, are, can be useful for solving uh, the, uh, the equation. Um, and here, uh, you can see the structure of our, um, our tool, our solver. So, uh, clearly, once again, the main focus of the, the multiphysics uh, here is the coupling between the thermal hydraulic part and the neutronics part. Once again, because from the reactor physics, we know the strong coupling between these two, uh, these two physics, and uh, it's even more, uh, let's say, a strict coupling in case of uh, the molten salt reactor in which we have uh, a coolant which is also acts also as a, as a fuel. Uh, so then we have this first part related to the thermal hydraulics and the neutronics um, part. And in each, let's say, um, in each main blocks, we'll see uh, the, uh, we'll have the, uh, the characteristic equation for a given variable. So um, since OpenFOAM uh, uses the, um, the approach that uh, OpenFOAM uses is solving once at a time uh, the equation related to one variable. So, uh, for example, for the thermal hydraulics, uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll have an equation which uh, will uh, solve for the velocity, one for the pressure, one for the energy, and so on and so forth. But then we, we have also seen that uh, during the, the Dennis lecture that uh, uh, in order to really perform some multiphysics calculation, we need to couple the different, let's say, physics, the different variable. Uh, we have different approaches as we have seen, and here what we, uh, what OpenFOAM usually uh, employs is the uh, Picard iteration. So the combination between solving one equation per uh, time and the uh, coupling with the, with the Picard iteration. Uh, in this way, we can uh, uh, be sure that our uh, coupled equations are solved in a correct way uh, within a unique time step. So the peculiarity of the uh, of this multiphysics tool is that we can also consider we can also study the impact of the helium bubble. So uh, the equation and the modeling that uh, are present in this tool for the neutronics part, neutronics part is, are quite standard in terms of uh, uh, equation employed. We can solve for uh, a multigroup neutron diffusion uh, option or a multigroup SP3 
transport equation, so a simplified PN uh, equation. And then for sure, it's something that we cannot uh, avoid is to include the transport equation both for the precursors and also for the uh, decay heat. Um, the, let's say, peculiar things uh, here is that if we want to study also the effect of the, the helium bubbling inside the system, so uh, as, I, as I remind you that uh, in the molten salt fast reactor design, uh, an helium flow is uh, uh, foreseen in order to extract the, uh, the fission product from the, uh, from the salt. So if we want to study the effect of this, uh, of this device, so the presence of a gas flow inside the reactor, then we have to change a little bit our modeling approach for the uh, thermal hydraulics part, because uh, uh, we cannot rely just on a, a single phase incompressible uh, flow. So we have to deal with two fluid or two phase um, um, modeling. We can have different approaches in order to uh, deal with the, this problem. We can go for a surface tracking, we can go for a moving mesh um, approach. What we have selected is a, a volume tracking uh, approach uh, since uh, the helium, uh, since we can consider uh, the helium as a dispersed phase in a continuum one which is, continuous one which is the salt. So in the volume tracking uh, approach, uh, we just consider a given parameter that represents the effect of the dispersed phase on the global, um, on the global uh, characteristic of the fluid flow. And in this case, this parameter is simply the phase fraction. Um, then, so it's a, it, the approach that we implemented, it's a two-phase compressible uh, model based on an Euler-Euler approach. So in Euler-Euler means that uh, we are considering an Euler averaging both on the salt and in the, um, in the gas phase. This uh, helps, let's say, simplify a lot the, uh, uh, the, the computational, uh, let's say, complexity because otherwise we have to, let's say, follow the, and track all the single um, bubbles, which is probably on one end uh, not feasible, on the other end also not so interesting because what we, have, we want to, to study is the uh, global effect of this, uh, uh, of this device on uh, the uh, reactor system. Um, so, Euler averaging for both salt and, and, uh, uh, and uh, gas phases plus volume tracking, we end up with this uh, system of equation. So for each phase, we have an equation for the phase fraction, for the momentum equation, and for the energy equation. As a, let's say, classic uh, uh, byproduct of uh, um, having uh, employed an averaging uh, approach, uh, also, for example, you think about uh, the, the same may happen in, with the RANS uh, approach. So if we perform an averaging process with the, the CFT, then we have to, um, to, uh, to deal with the, uh, the need of some closure relationship. relationship. For example, this, uh, Emma is the closure relationship that, or better, this term represents the, um, the momentum transfer between the different phases, and this term requires some uh, closure uh, relations. Uh, so, uh, as an application of this, uh, uh, of this tool, we have uh, uh, tried to assess the uh, void reactivity coefficient inside the, the reactor and uh, considering the real distribution of the bubble. So you, you may know that uh, if uh, we are injecting some bubbles in, uh, in the reactor, in this case, in the molten salt reactor, uh, we are basically pushing away some fuel. So we are avoiding our reactor. 
since we are in a in a in a fast system, then this means that we have a a, a negative effect. So uh, usually uh, we can uh, let's say calculate this effect and this coefficient assuming a uniform bubble distribution, or if we have uh, a tool that can calculate the distribution of the bubble inside my system, I can also take into account the effect of this distribution. And you can see here that we have, uh, uh, we have considered this uh, as the, the bubble injection. So the bubble are inserted here in the, in the reactor and then are, uh, they are transported through the, the reactor in this, in this zone. What uh, uh, has been found thanks to this uh, multi-physics approach is that, uh, okay, we cannot really uh, consider the bubble distribution as uniform or better, especially if we consider just one injection point, uh, because uh, actually the bubble, uh, uh, the, the bubble has a, a proper uh, uh, distribution and especially they tend to let's say, to be collected in the center of the core where the importance of the feedback is it's higher with respect to the periphery of the core. And what we found is that, okay, with the uniform bubble distribution, we have a, a reactivity, void reactivity coefficient of uh, something close to uh, 170 PCM uh, over um, percent of void, but once if we employ a calculated bubble distribution, a real bubble distribution, this uh, it's almost the double. So the, the, the coefficient is uh, two times uh, more. And this is important if you think that uh, the, the presence of this helium bubbling may also uh, uh, be a, let's say, a, a possible um, initiator, accident initiator event, if you stop the, the bubble flow, and then you have a, a decrease of the bubble and then an increase of the reactivity. So having this, a, a correct estimation of this number, it's very important for safety, for safety reason. And uh, I mean, this, the, 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 this, uh, this approach has been also used in order to, um, to provide Monte Carlo simulation with the real distribution of the system. And actually, we have seen that more or less the uh, the effect is uh, uh, is the same, even if we are calculating the effect through a Monte Carlo uh, code instead of our diffusion or SP3 uh, SP3 solver. Uh, so this is just one example of what we can, uh, let's say, uh, extract or uh, obtain from our multi-physics tool. Uh, then, uh, as uh, uh, as information from the uh, as development in uh, that uh, is currently actually is currently in, um, ongoing in uh, in the Samosafer uh, project, it's okay. Once we have the uh, this uh, the capability of studying the helium bubbling system, what if uh, why not considering also the transport of the gaseous fission product? So how the helium bubbling system is able to extract uh, the, uh, the fission product, in this case, the, the gaseous fission product in my, uh, in my molten salt fast reactor. And the approach used here is a multi-component modeling. So we consider the xenon that has been taken as its elective um, gaseous fission product in both the phases, so both in the liquid and uh, in the gaseous. And uh, once again, we have implemented uh, um, a mass transfer uh, equation between the xenon in the liquid phase and the gaseous phase. Then we can, uh, at the end of the day, what we can, uh, let's say, estimate is how much of xenon we can extract thanks to the, uh, to the helium bubbling. Uh, obviously, also this, this approach relies on some uh, closure equation or some hypothesis or some, uh, let's say, uh, correlation. Uh, for example, the, the classic approach that is used in this case is relying on the early law in order to consider which is the, um, the, the, the concentration 
the maximum concentration and the concentration of the equilibrium. Uh, uh, then, so this is an example of uh, the use of this new feature. Uh, this is a, an old uh, geometry for the multisulfast fast reactor. So the, the, the square one. And uh, here you can see, for example, the effect. Uh, so these are the different, let's say, um, the different field that we can uh, uh, visualize and we can calculate uh, thanks to the uh, multi-physics tool. So the, the temperature, the velocity, the fissure rate, and also with the, the, this new feature, the xenon liquid concentration. Once again, you can see here that thanks to this uh, non-optimized uh, shape, we have a stagnation of the xenon close to the uh, uh, to the wall of the of the reactor. Because once again, you can see here that in this zone, the fluid is almost stagnant. But if we consider the uh, uh, also the the helium bubbling removal, you can see that the effect on the xenon here, and uh, you can see the, that we have almost uh, half the concentration of the, uh, of the xenon inside the source. So this means that half of this xenon has been taken away thanks to the helium bubbling. Uh, this is very important. I mean, the, the, uh, the information that you can extract from this, uh, uh, from this solver is very important because we can really assessing the efficiency of the helium bubbling for uh, the uh, xenon removal or in general from of any other uh, gaseous fission product. And uh, as you can see, we can uh, here, for example, we can calculate a characteristic time that allows us to, uh, let's say, um, summarize the effect of the helium bubbling removal also for other applications. Let's think about the application for or the codes for burn up uh, the, the burn up evolution, uh, the evolution of the fuel uh, composition. So the burn up codes that, that this kind of code usually rely on uh, on Bateman equation on uh, eventually coupled with the uh, uh, with the Monte Carlo code. Uh, they need if you want to, to, to employ this kind of code for molten salt fast reactor, you have also to consider the exchange term uh, with, uh, with other sources. Uh, in this case, for example, the helium bubbling, it's a, a, a sink for the, um, for the element uh, uh, inside, the, uh, inside the, the reactor. So uh, in order to, to, be, to be, let's say, uh, uh, to provide the information of the efficiency of this, system to the burn-up code, we need to provide a kind of characteristic time that uh, uh, represent this efficiency. And uh, with this, uh, um, this multi-physics tool, we can, uh, let's say, estimate this, uh, this value. So I think this is, uh, uh, this is all. These are some uh, conclusion, but I think we can skip. OK, so. Uh, the third part, indeed, uh, as Stefano said, is about uh, a multi-physics benchmark uh, for codes dedicated to MS policy. Yeah, because the thing is this, we describe the, the, the multi-physics phenomena that are peculiar to fast spectrums, molten salt reactors. We have described uh, uh, how to simulate uh, these physics phenomena. We have provided some uh, examples of codes that have been developed and are still being developed um, to simulate uh, these, these reactors but one important thing is that these codes are new these codes are very different from what you usually find uh, um, in say in the nuclear uh, community in the, in the nuclear industry which means that you also need to extensively validate uh, and uh, verify these tools in order to increase the confidence level uh, that, that we have in order to bring them closer to the to the level of, of industrial multiphysics tools but this is not easy uh, because we don't have experimental data uh, the only ones are available uh, say from the msre uh, activities in, in the 60s but 
as I said already before, this was a quite different uh, reactor design, so it's not very useful to validate, uh, uh, let's say, uh, fully the all the routines, uh, all the physics phenomena uh, that are to be found uh, in a molten salt fast reactor. Um, and more in general, it's very easy to sim to verify, to test, to benchmark the single physics codes. There is a plethora of benchmarks that you can find uh, uh, about neutronics, about CFD, uh, as single physics uh, uh, codes, but it's very difficult to test that the coupling between these codes is done uh, consistently, it's done correctly, without introducing biases. And without considering, let's say, complex scenarios in which the complexity itself uh, might hinder the reason behind the uh, possible discrepancies between codes. Is there an actual error or it's just, uh, uh, I mean, discrepancies might just derive from uh, choices, modeling choices. So for all these reasons, uh, um, at LPC, CNRS Grenoble, they developed uh, a numerical benchmark uh, that is specifically dedicated to the benchmarking of multi-physics codes for molten salt fast reactors. And uh, this benchmark has been adopted in SAMOFAR and still uh, is used uh, inside SAMOSAFER to benchmark the multi-physics tools uh, uh, under development. Um, the key aspects of this benchmark, which I'm going to, to describe you, are that uh, it's a simple problem. Okay, it's, it's very simple. Here you see the domain. It's a square cavity filled with molten salt, but still uh, the physics, uh, let's say, the, the describing this system, it's quite similar to the one proper of the uh, MSFR because uh, the spectrum is fast, the salt composition, it's not very different. It's always yeah, thorium, uranium, or chloride. Um, there is a negative, temp strong negative temperature feedback. Of course, you find the precursors drift and so on and so forth. The key aspect of this benchmark is that it's divided into steps and into phases in which stationary or transient problems are solved, but uh, in which the physics phenomena are gradually coupled together. So as we will see, there is the phase zero in which uh, we uh, study single physics steady state problems. So not very different from other problems you find in literature. But then this step, it's necessary to be sure that we can actually move on and study the, the, the coupling between the, the different physics. So in phase one, we will study steady state problems in which uh, we couple one physics at the time. And in such a way, it's very easy to see uh, if there are discrepancies between the codes and to understand where they come from and so eventually to uh, fix possible errors. And uh, the, another key aspect is indeed the simplicity. So models like uh, complex phenomena like uh, uh, turbulence or Doppler feedback uh, are not taken into account because as I said before, uh, in order to model this phenomena, often you have to uh, make uh, assumptions which might lead to discrepancies between codes. Uh, and so it's better to, to avoid, and it's not related to the, to the coupling itself, to the correctness of the coupling itself between the physics. Here you have a list of the main uh, characteristics of the domain uh, study. So it's, it's a square cavity, it's a two meters by two meter cavity. It's filled with this salt. The nuclear data are prescribed, six groups nuclear data, uh, which means there is no discrepancy uh, to begin with uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of this of this data. Uh, as I said, no Doppler feedback is considered. Only uh, density feedback uh, is considered for temperature correction. The flow is laminar. Reynolds inside this cavity is forty. Um, the booziness approximation again is made for uh, is, is is adopted for buoyancy, which means that the, the density is constant, as well as all the other thermodynamic properties. They are constant with uh, with temperature. The only thing that it's not done is to prescribe a neutronics model, which means that this benchmark is suitable for testing quite a large spectrum of uh, uh, multi physics tools uh, targeting uh, uh, the MSFR. In terms of boundary conditions, uh, uh, so this is a simple homogeneous Bayer reactor 
from the Netronics point of view, which means that you also have to so you impose the standard vacuum conditions and homogeneous Neumann for the precursors. From the flow field point of view, it's a lead driven cavity problem. So uh, you impose no slip, zero velocity um, conditions at the uh, at three walls, whereas the top wall, um, you find uh, at the top wall, you find a, a lead velocity imposed. And then the uh, the salt, of course, is hidden up by, by uh, fission, by fission power, and which means that you need to have uh, uh, certain salt cooling in order to find the steady state but the uh, the walls are adiabatic which means that we introduce in the system a volumetric uh, heat sink described by this volumetric heat transfer coefficient that we call gamma so, um, so this was just to give you an overview of the characteristics of the benchmark uh, for those who are interested uh, you can find all the other uh, i mean you can find a more a more uh, detailed description at this uh, at this link so let's see um so i i will now go through the uh, first uh, steps of the benchmark and in terms of the single physics uh, steps i will just show you the results because i believe they are not very interesting uh, i mean as i said single physics problems single physics benchmark there are plenty in literature. What we mm, will do later, what you will do later, is that go through the coupled steps, uh, I mean, the steps in which the physics are coupled together uh, one at a time uh, in a more interactive way. So the, in the phase zero, step zero one, just the velocity field is solved. So there's the steady state, incompressible flow, isothermal uh, is, is, uh, is studied. So this is just, uh, as we said, the simple lead driven cavity problem with the Reynolds of 40. Um, and at each of these steps, uh, we compared the, the results obtained by the codes. And as you can see here, in this case, we compared as natural the flow field obtained and also velocity profiles. And fortunately, all the codes uh, uh, participating to the benchmark uh, uh, in some of our uh, gave the same answer and of course uh, this is necessary otherwise it's not uh, uh, there, there's no um, uh, consistent multiphysics coupling uh, later on in the second step uh, that we study just uh, the neutronics problem so uh, we study the solution of uh, the neutronics criticality eigenvalue problem so here, steady state means that we solve uh, eigenvalue problems from the neutronics point of view in case of static fuel and isothermal fuel. So what we did is to impose a homogeneous, uh, uh, a uniform temperature of 900 Kelvin. A normalization condition is imposed, of course, uh, the, the reactor power, one gigawatt. And then we studied the, uh, we compared the fission rate densities obtained by the different codes and the uh, eigenvalue obtained. And here you see uh, certain discrepancies between the codes related to the fact that the neutronics models adopted um, was, was quite different. So, for example, the CNRS tool uh, adopted an SPN discretization. Field Elft, uh, as we saw before, uh, implements an SN multigroup problem, whereas uh, both Polini and also PSI adopted a, a diffusion uh, neutronics uh, solver. But still, the discrepancies uh, are uh, reasonable and well explained by different, uh, by the choice of different neutronics models. What is interesting from now on is that we will compare not reactivities, absolute values of reactivities, but reactivity differences uh, with respect to this uh, to this phase, so that the differences uh, related to the choice of the neutronics model are uh, they cancel out? They cancel out. And finally, the last uh, step of the single physics phase is uh, a step in which we study the temperature field. So fixing the flow field from the step zero one, fixing the power distribution from the step zero two, we studied the solution of the energy equation imposing uh, this uh, volumetric uh, heat transfer coefficient. Because of course, this is another key thing 
necessary for a correct multiphysics Galtwin. You need to solve correctly the passive scalar transport equation. And temperature here, it's like a passive scalar because indeed there is no coupling uh, between uh, neutronics and, uh, and the energy equation and also between the uh, momentum equation and the temperature equation. And we compared the, the uh, temperature distribution inside the cavity and as well as the temperature along the certain line, the central lines. And discrepancies here are limit, were limited to uh, just 0.3%. 0, 0 and then the interesting phase uh, comes because in phase one, we start coupling the physics together. So in step one, step 1.1, we, we say, okay, so let's fix the flow field from step zero one. And let's study the neutronics problem with isothermal fuel, but in presence of fuel motion. So these steps, this step, sorry, ensures that, um, assesses that the uh, effect of the drift of precursors is correctly simulated and modeled by the different tools. And indeed the output, uh, Studied is the concentration of the late neutron precursors, um, distribute, the distribution of, uh, of uh, uh, the late neutron precursors, and the reactivity change with respect to the um, static fuel case. And we will see the results later. In the step 1.2, instead, we make a step further. So we say, okay, from the solution of the uh, neutronics problem with the fuel motion, we still keep the flow field fixed, but now we add the, th the thermal feedback. So we solve the temperature equation. We solve for the, we solve for the energy and we evaluate that the uh, cross-sections are corrected with the temperature in a correct way, which means that, and at the same time, we uh, study the, that the, 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 the let's say, the, 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 the the energy source deriving from the fission power is implemented correctly. And so we are, with, as a goal, we want to compare the temperature distribution in the, the reactivity change with respect to step 1.1, because now we just want to see if the effect of uh, thermal feedback is taken into account correctly. And, we, and then we also, uh, compare the change of the fission rate uh, uh, density, meaning the, we want to see if the power field is distorted uh, in the same way between all the codes. And finally, the last step, uh, step 1.4, uh, should be 1.3 actually, uh, it's, the full, it's the full coupled problem. It's the full coupled problems in which we finally also solve for the flow field, uh, so there's no, there's nothing fixed. The only fixed things are the uh, boundary conditions. So the lead uh, velocity, which can vary between zero and 0 0.5, uh, because this step performs also a parametric study, which means that you can vary from a full uh, uh, force convection regime to a regime in which there is only natural circulation. And you can also vary the power because Varying the power, you vary the energy content inside the system. The, 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 the volumetric heat transfer coefficient is fixed. And then for each combination of these parameters, the reactivity change from the step 0 0.2 is, uh, is studied. And in this step, so uh, the, the, the complete effect of all the, uh, say, deriving from the coupling of all the physics, is, uh, is, is assessed. Okay, so this was just uh, an overview of the, of the benchmark. Now I will leave the floor to, to Stefano for the, let's say, hands-on session. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marco. So... You should see now my black screen, right? Yes, no, Marco, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So in the hands-out menu, you can find the uh, 
uh, a PDF file in which there is a link uh, where you can download the, uh, the material for this interactive part. So what you will found, found is that uh, you will find this, this uh, um, uh, school uh, OF zip uh, in which there are the two, let's say, main uh, um, important objects when you deal with the open foam uh, simulation. One is the solver and one is the, the case. So the solver if we go to solver folder, we are interested in the MSFR demo simple form, which is a complex way to say that in this case, uh, it's uh, the solver, it's in a steady state, uh, it's a steady state solver because of the simple, uh, um, simple uh, um, approach, simple uh, um, loop that we will uh, employ. So the structure of a solver in open form, it's, uh, let's say, composed by a different, let's say, file. Uh, you can see here the .h file and the main one, which is uh, the uh, .c file, which, which usually has the same name of the solver. So if we uh, have a look on the solver, apart uh, this with the uh, commented part, we'll see that uh, this is the classic C++ uh, structure in which you can include different, uh, let's say other file or other uh, function. What is in the interesting part is uh, this one. So uh, in this one, we are really, uh, solving the loop that we saw in the presentation. So here I'm saying that while there is the, uh, the time loop, in this case is a simple loop, so it will be just iteration, will not go into the time dependent detail. Then you will solve the uh, u equation dot h, which is the one for the uh, velocity the one for the temperature, uh, then these are the ones from the uh, flux, uh, the precursor, the decay equation, and the pressure. So the, uh, this, uh, this structure, it's actually, it's simple. I mean, it's not so difficult, but it's the, the core of the solver because uh, uh, it describes the, uh, let's say, the coupling approach that we want to use between the different, among the different equation. In this case, we have a velocity, temperature, flux, uh, uh, precursors, decay, and, and pressure, and how to uh, deal with that. In this case, since uh, we are dealing with a, a simple loop, so a, an iterative process, so we just continuously iterating uh, along uh, the um, uh, along the, the time, but it's not actually a time, it's simply a, a steady state iteration. The, the order of the um, solution of the uh, equation solution is not so important because then we'll continue to iterate at each uh, uh, iteration step. So if we have a look on uh, uh, one of the equation, so for example, let's have a look on the precursor. Um, uh, file. So we saw that inside the loop we are we put the uh, prec equation dot h. What we found here it's really the uh, let's say the implementation of the equation. One of the um, advantages of the uh, of the open form is that you can really use something which is close to to what uh, you uh, you use what are the what is the the the, the um, let's say the equation that describe your uh, your quantity. So in this case uh, we are using the this uh, is the transport term uh, between phi, which is the phase flux and the precursors. This is the 
diffusive term, the Laplacian term for the, the precursor, because once again, remember that here we want to simulate also, or mainly, the um, transport of uh, the precursors. Uh, and then we have the decay of the precursor, like in a standard uh, precursor equation, and then the creation. So for each of the uh, variable that we are interested in and we want to solve for, we have a, a file that describes the, the equation. Uh, so for example, we can have a look on the temperature equation, which is a little bit more uh, complicated, but once again, here we have the classic structure of a conservation equation, which we have. Uh, so we, here we don't have the time derivative because it's a, it's a steady state calculation, but then we have the transport term, the diffusion term, and all the other terms. So uh, in addition to that, uh, you, we have, uh, so this is the solver. Uh, in order to uh, run this solver, you can just uh, compile it with the all of make command. Uh, for sure, I mean, uh, this, uh, uh, you should know some, uh, let's say, basics of the, of the open form. Otherwise, there are plenty of tutorial if you want to start. So we say that for the simulation, we need a solver, which is actually the, uh, the, the stuff that solve the equation, but then we, have, we need also a case, so a simulation case that we want to solve. And this is uh, the, uh, what you will find in the tutorials, benchmark case. Uh, and uh, this is the classic structure of uh, an open form uh, case in which we will have a constant uh, folder, a system folder, and uh, a zero folder. In a, uh, in, the PDF, in a PDF that you find uh, once again in the ends out uh, menu, uh, the uh, Samo Safer School module 3.3, you will find a description, a very short description of the, uh, let's say, the um, different functionality of the different files that are in the constant folder, in the system folder, and in the zero folder. Just briefly, uh, in the zero folder, uh, you will find uh, the initial and boundary condition for the different, um, for the different variable. Uh, so, for example, here you, you will find that there is a, a, a file for the six, uh, for the flux of the fourth group, the uh, file for the flux for the fifth group of the flux, the precursor family concentration, T is the temperature, U is the velocity, and let's have a look really briefly on that. And here you will have to prescribe both the initial condition and the boundary condition. Then in the other, um, so in the other uh, folder, like in constant in system, you will find all the file that prescribe you, for example, the parameter that uh, you want uh, to consider in, uh, in your problem. We say that, for example, for the sinners benchmark will be important the neutronics parameters, so the neutronics cross section. Uh, or in system, you will find that the, all the, the setting for your uh, uh, simulation, the starting time, the end time, the accuracy or the residual also of your, uh, uh, of your equation or better, the residual of the uh, linear solver for each of the one of your variable and also the um, um, the, uh, the residual of the, your coupled loop. So you, for example, in this case, let's give an example. Uh, so in FB solution, a part of the, all the information related to the linear system that uh, you want to employ for each uh, equation and variable, you can also prescribe the let's say the residual control of your uh, simple loop. So this means that in order to end your calculation, your uh, steady state calculation, the error on the temperature should be below one to one 
10 to the minus 7. Uh, so let's, since time is running, let's go to and see uh, the uh, uh, some result. So, for example, let's see the uh, the result of the benchmark of the step 0 0.2. Uh, I have already run the uh, the the solver. I mean, the how to run the solver. There is uh, two option, or you use the all run comment, which is a, a script that, uh, let's say, run different command or just simply um, type the name of the uh, of your uh, uh, solver inside the case folder. So once again, keep in mind the difference between the case and then the solver. But let's uh, have a look on the results. So first of all, we can uh, have the information about the uh, the reactivity. So uh, Marco uh, show you a table in which we have uh, seen uh, the reactivity of the step 0 0.2. Actually, for the polymer solver was uh, in the in the benchmark result uh, we found 410 PCM. Here we have 466. Uh, this 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 difference is due to the fact that here we are using uh, 100 by 100 mesh, uh, 100 by 100 element mesh because of the sake of uh, computational uh, time. If you want, you can modify the mesh, increasing the size of the mesh, and see if we are reaching the, the same value. This is the uh, the solve the the file. Uh, that, uh, uh, let's say, is the output of the R simulation that uh, allow you, allows you to, to have information about the, the residual of the, of the solver, but mostly in this case, uh, uh, so once again here, this is a steady state uh, um, solver, and uh, this means that uh, we are solving uh, an eigenvalue uh, problem through a power iteration method and at the end of the day one of the it's important information is the reactivity or no, the multiplication factor of the system so here we have 466 but let's have a look on the uh let's say on the result of the field uh, so now I'm not so sure of what uh, so you are seeing the uh, Paraview screen or not? No. Okay, so let me just re... Now, you okay, should... now yes, we do see. Yeah. Uh, so these are the results of the benchmark, uh, uh, the step 0 0.2 benchmark step. So you can see that here, we have the um, the velocity uh, distribution inside the uh, the cavity. Uh, then no temperature, uh, right? Because or better, isothermal temperature in uh, in this case. So this is the the base um, the base case. In addition to that, uh, we say that we take this as a reference also for the precursor. So let's uh, add also the flux information and the precursor information. Okay, so now we have also the flux information and you can see this is the flux for the first group, from the second group, and so uh, Stefano, I, I do not see anything changing. Yeah, because probably it's the, I mean the, the shape of the flux is the same. I mean, so it's not so. Okay. I mean, for example, do you see that now it's temperature, right? Uh, or not? It's just the velocity. I mean, I, I still see the velocity. You are seeing just the velocity? Okay. It might be that I, I have a problem. I don't know if other people are experiencing so the same. I, let's re. 
what about now no no they are saying that same problem okay okay now i i do see the flux okay okay sorry about that so i have to, to switch uh, in the, in the sharing part uh, and you can see here for example that since so the, the step zero two is the reference one and uh, here you should see that this is the precursor distribution since we are not uh, allowing the precursors to to move uh, along the system uh, you will see that they will have the same shape of the flux this is the classic uh, um, case for uh, uh, non-circulating fuel. So le let's have a look on the uh, on the case with the circulating fuel. So uh, let's go back here. So then, uh, if we go to the uh, so let's directly to the solved part. So what do you expect from this uh, uh, from this result? So now we are allowing the precursors to move inside the, the reactor. What do you expect uh, from the, the reactivity point of view? The reactivity should increase or decrease? Decrease, increase, increase, decrease. So we have 50 50. So even if we are not, uh, we are not, uh, so in this system, we don't have uh, some uh, recircul circulation of precursor outside the reactor. We are just having a mix inside the cavity. So in principle, we cannot say that this will increase or decrease, uh, but actually since uh, uh, the given the, the, the lead driven, uh, let's say, uh, flow path, this will uh, lead to a decrease of the activity. So let, let's see what, uh, what happened. And actually here, you can see that our reactivity has been decreased by 60 PCM. Um, so even, once again, even if we don't have the, um, the external circuit, just the fact that the precursor can move, can be transported by the velocity of the system as an impact of the reactor. And in this case, uh, it's, uh, the so let's go let's see the, the velocity field so uh in this case oh, but i mean it's the same of the previous one not let's see once uh, once more uh, uh, here we go So here you can see the, the velocity. Here we go. So let's do, let's see if we can see a little bit the, uh, the vector here. Um, okay, probably it's this too much. Here we go. You can see here the path of the velocity, which is mainly, I mean, you can see that mainly they are, let's say, removing the uh, precursor from the center of the core and they transport to the outside, let's say, the center of the core, so in the periphery. And once again, this is in terms of uh, importance of this effect. So since uh, we are uh, 
moving precursor from the center of the core where if they decay the importance of the um, delayed neutron it's higher with respect of a decay a neutron that come from a decay in the periphery of the uh, of the uh, of the system so in this case just simply because we are basically steering our system we are moving away the precursor from the center to the periphery then we have a decrease of the um, of the reactivity even if it's not so strong like in the uh, in the molten salt fast reactor in which we have also the external circuit that uh, allows we also to the, the, the decay outside the let's say the active core uh, so let's have a look on the precursor distribution now uh, so uh, let's delete this one and that one uh, so let's see the flux some example and then the precursor s12 78 okay so this is once again more or less the flux has not changed so much with respect to the previous uh, case but what you can see is that now the precursor distribution of the precursor it's quite different with respect to uh, the previous case the previous case was exactly the same shape of the flux now since the precursor can be transported through the system it's uh, it's different and you can see that especially for this one the peak is not only in the center but it's rather in the periphery of the system uh, and then you can see here also the precursor of the second group then these are the precursor of the eighth family which are the one which has the most fastest fast decaying constant and you can see that for those uh, uh, precursor the effect of the velocity is not so high because they have a fast decay but on the other end if we go for the if we look for the um, the precursor which has a long decaying constant then the shape is is totally different and this effect introduced for what we have said the um, the, um, the implies a reduction of the reactivity um okay i think we don't have so much uh time um i will just uh, uh let's let's go back here okay so uh then i mean you can then uh, continue with your uh with your benchmark and for example do the second the, the step 1.2 in which you simply activate the power coupling you can do this uh, uh, if you go in a system folder and control dict and you can see here that there is the temperature coupling um, a flag for the temperature coupling and if you go to to yes then you will see that uh, uh, you will have also the you will solve also for the temperature and also for the coupling between the electronics and the temperature if we see the um uh, no if we see the log now okay now we see that the reactivity has decreased a lot that's just because of the uh, reactivity coefficient so now we have instead of having a constant temperature we have a, a temperature distribution and this mean and which is way higher than the, the previous one uh, and these uh, in, since we this kind of system are, are characterized by negative reactivity feedback the increase of temperature means a decrease of uh, reactivity so let's have a brief look on the result okay 
here. So, for example, this is the temperature. And you can see here that now we have a distribution of temperature ranging from 900 Kelvin to almost 1400 Kelvin. And so this means that we have also a, an effect on the, uh, yes, on the reactivity of the system. And um, okay, so we, we, we have run all the time. So uh, I will, so you can uh, download the, uh, both the solver and the case. You can modify it if you want. You have the, uh, the uh, paper as a reference to be guided through the, uh, through the benchmark phases uh, if you want. So you can uh, easily play with that.